It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Uh, my first question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier insisted that his government should not be criticized for their underfunded, inadequate COVID-19 response because other jurisdictions actually have it worse. Yet there are neighbourhoods in Brampton that have a COVID-19 positivity rate of nearly 20 per cent. One doctor describes this, and I'll quote, staggering number that suggests that there is a huge problem, end quote. There are now 165 patients in the ICU. That is one out of every 10 ICU beds in this province. When is the Premier going to stop justifying his inaction and start supporting people living in these hard-hit communities and the hospitals that serve them? The Deputy Premier, the Minister of Health. Uh, well, in fact, we are supporting uh, Peel and the entire area since they have, uh, unfortunately, needed to go into lockdown, as with the uh, City of Toronto. We recognize that they need additional supports in order to deal with the rapidly increasing number of cases that they're seeing. What we have done is sent more uh, case and contact managers into the area to assist with um, helping to identify people who have COVID-19 and their contacts. We're also expanding the hospital facilities for people that need to be uh, in the hospital, and we're making sure that uh, we have received help from some of the other public health units that don't have as high a number of cases in order to help by telephone support with case and contact management. So we recognize that Peel is going through a very difficult time. We want to help Peel get out of the lockdown as soon as possible, and we are providing necessary resources in order to help Peel to get there. The supplementary question. Speaker, every day the Ford government downplays the impact of this pandemic. Peel Public Health data shows that essential workers on the front lines in manufacturing, transportation and health care have been exponentially more likely to be infected. They are not doing well, as the Premier likes to pretend. These people are facing a crisis and facing it without help from this government. When will this government stop trying to protect itself and its bottom line and start taking real action to protect and support the people in this province who need it most? Minister of Health. Well, uh just to indicate the support that we are providing to Peel, we have established three new community-based testing centres. We have implemented mobile testing sites. We are opening limited walk-in availability at assessment centres for those people who are not able to either book online or make telephone appointments. And we are implementing up to seven pharmacies or specimen collection centres in the next several weeks. We also have invested $42 million for up to 234 new beds at three hospitals, including alternate health facilities in Peel Region to support hospital capacity pressures and the continuation of surgeries and procedures. So we are providing both health supports in terms of hospital beds and supports as well as contact managing, testing and tracing. Speaker, um, and through you to the minister, but help in a few weeks is not going to help us today. Uh, working people in these communities hit hardest by COVID-19 don't need the premier to continue to tell them that the pandemic could be worse. They need this government to actually step up with dedicated resources for testing and contact tracing through this pandemic, culturally specific COVID-19 outreach, urgent and direct support for small businesses, and direct support for those people who work with them. Start with a guarantee that they can leave work when sick without losing a day's pay. When will we see any of this? Minister. Well, the supports have been provided in the health care field as well as in the economic field. I believe that is what you are also referring to. Uh, and we are providing, we're doubling the amount of emergency management assistance that we're providing from $300 million to $600 million, recognizing that there are many economic uh, disadvantages that come from a lockdown in both Peel and Toronto. But from the health side, we're also uh, adding to the number of beds. William Osler Health System is receiving up to 87 total beds. 41 beds at Brampton Civic and 46 beds at Etobicoke General. Trillium Health Partners will be receiving up to 141 
total new beds and 99 beds at Mississauga Hospital, uh, 23 acute beds, 70 beds as part of the pandemic response unit, and uh, the list goes on. So we are dealing with both the economic as well as the health effects, recognizing that Peel is in a difficult situation right now, and we will be there to assist them. Thank you. The next question, once again, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. And my question again is to the Premier. Yesterday, another nine residents died from COVID-19 in Ontario's long-term care homes. For months, the Ford government has insisted that the growing spread of COVID-19 in long-term care was not a cause for concern. But Dr. Emmett Arya, director of the Canadian Society of Palliative Care Physicians, disagreed yesterday, saying, and I'll quote, we had months in the summer to prepare for this. So as cases and mortality start to accelerate in long-term care, it's absolutely devastating." End quote. Why does the Ford government continue to deny the reality of our long-term care homes? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Speak thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Our government has acted swiftly and decisively since the beginning, and I, I reject the premise of, of that question uh, regarding the seriousness with which our government has taken the concerns of COVID-19 in long-term care homes. Uh, it has been absolutely consistent that our number one concern is the residents and, and, and staff safety in long-term care homes. They are our priority, and there is no doubt. We have taken measures all along. Uh, the $243 million to put up immediately to support our staffing in our long-term care homes, $405 million to support more staffing supports uh, just a few weeks ago, $61.4 million uh, to help our homes uh, repair with repairs and renovations that would better prepare them for COVID and to deal with it, $30 million uh, for more infection Response. prevention and control, uh, $10 million for training, uh, $26.3 million for future support for PSWs, $14 million for PSW training. And the list goes on and on, Speaker. We have never stopped, and we will continue. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, the Canadian Association of Retired Persons has joined the chorus of voices expressing their concern about the government's failure to address the crisis in long-term care. I'll quote, we can't afford to wait any longer in protecting vulnerable residents in Ontario's out outbreak-stricken long-term care homes. The time for change is now, and it starts at the top. CARP goes on to say, remove the Ontario Minister of Long-Term Care so that we, as a province, have a fighting chance to fix the system before we suffer another uncontrollable wave of deaths." End quote. Will the Premier listen to the growing concerns of people demanding urgent action and do that? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And I, you know, I I recognize around the world the challenges faced uh, by countries pushing back against COVID-19. Ontario has consistently worked with its experts, its medical experts, as the science evolved on COVID-19 to add more layers. Wave one. Uh, the whole world was affected by that. Lessons have been learned from wave one, and we're using the expertise that, through our medical experts, our public health tables, uh, hundreds of experts that are providing support and information, and this has never stopped. It's ongoing. The rapid testing that we'll be, we'll be able to get out to our homes soon. Uh, again, many reasons why by, that, that has not been able to be more expedient, and we've worked with our federal partners to be able to have access to those rapid tests, but the world has been affected by COVID-19. Ontario has not been Response. alone in that. And we are continuing to make sure that our homes have all the PPE that is necessary and the staffing. And there's no home right now with the staffing, a critical sh a shortage of staff or PPE. Our homes are doing much better. 92% of our homes. Very much. Thank you. And the final supplementary. After the first wave of the pandemic, the Ford government promised residents in long-term care homes and their families that lessons had been learned and change was coming. They are now watching in horror as the virus once again spreads through facilities that are understaffed, underprepared, and unchanged. Instead of taking action to protect our seniors from COVID-19, this government decided to protect long-term care operators from legal liability. Shame. Why is the Premier protecting his minister instead of protecting vulnerable seniors? The parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. 
Let me be absolutely clear. Individuals and organizations that ignore public health guidance and act with gross negligence or intentional misconduct will not be protected by our legislation. The narrow targeted civil liability protection in this legislation has only to do with the inadvertent transmission of COVID-19 and nothing else. This legislation does not protect any other type of negligence that we hear from the opposition in this House or that we heard at committee, like if a resident is not given proper medication or a long-term care home fails to properly communicate with families or patients. Ontarians will continue to be able to file claims and seek justice, Speaker, for all these claims, including any criminal charges under any circumstance. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. With parts of the GTA now in lockdown and potentially more regions to follow, businesses are sounding the alarm over this government's refusal to provide clear direction over who can and can't stay open. Ontarians are used to a lack of clarity from this government, but even still, we are very concerned about the Premier's decision that forced small mom-and-pop shops to close down, all the while telling folks that it's A-OK -okay to still shop till you drop at big box stores like Walmart and Costco. So, Speaker, we looked a little closer and surprise, surprise, guess who's currently registered to lobby the Premier on Walmart's behalf? Why, it's Melissa Lansman, the Premier's former war room director, and now this all makes sense. Why is the Premier willing to let small Main Street businesses go under just because they couldn't afford to hire his friends? The government House Leader. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, look, uh, we are doing everything we possibly can and have been since the, uh, the onset of this pandemic to make sure that uh, we focus on the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario. As the Minister for Small Business uh, uh, mentioned uh, just yesterday, these are very difficult and challenging uh, decisions that we are making uh, in, in cooperation with uh, not only the Chief Medical Officer of Health, uh, but uh, with uh, medical officers of health in the regions across the province uh, of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. There are a significant number of resources in place for small businesses uh, to assist them uh, during this very, very difficult and, uh, and challenging time, Mr. Speaker. But uh, uh, as we've said from the beginning, as the Premier has clearly stated, it is our objective, our objective to make sure that, first and foremost, the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario is, uh, is, is assured, and that will lead uh, to a strong, vibrant uh, response. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much. So the Premier has said before, no one can influence him or his decision-making, but it turns out that there actually are a few people who the Premier does listen to. They just all happen to be former PC party staffers currently registered as lobbyists, Mr. Speaker. Along with Ms. Lansman, Walmart has also hired David Tarrant, the Premier's former Executive Director of Strategic Order. Communications, to lobby on their behalf. Together, these two PC party insiders set up a meeting with the Premier and the Walmart of CEO, where the CEO convinced the Premier that they had no choice but to stay open, even though their small competitors, Order. their small Main Street competitors, all had Order. to shut down. What does the Premier have to say to the small businesses that can't afford to hire PC insiders to arrange meetings with the Premier of Ontario? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing comes to order. The response? Government uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Minister Speaker. You didn't hear me. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I mean, truly, that it, it, what a remarkable question to, to be asking. I need to remind the, uh, the members of the opposition that these are the same orders that were put in place uh, uh, back in March, orders that were unanimously supported by members sure. of this legislature, unanimously supported by the members opposite, by the independents, Mr. Speaker. These are the same orders that were put in place to fight the pandemic in the early stages, and these are the orders that have been asked for by not only by the chief medical officer, Order. but by the medical officers of health in the two regions that are unfortunately on lockdown, Mr. Speaker. If the members opposite are suggesting that we forget about the health and safety of the people of the province of Ontario and put our focus somewhere else, I can assure the member opposite that on this side of the House, 
that's just not going to happen, Mr. Speaker. We know full well that the sooner we can flatten this curve, the sooner we'll have a, a more robust economic recovery, and that's exactly what we're going to do, despite the opposition from the NDP. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for small business and red tape reduction. Uh, Speaker, small businesses have always been at the heart of Ontario's economy in Niagara West and across the province. They represent jobs, hope, and opportunity for the people of this province. Due to the pandemic, thousands of small businesses across the province have had to close their doors to help contain the spread of COVID-19. I know this has been exceptionally difficult. Unfortunately, many small businesses in Ontario do not have an online presence, which makes it hard for them to deal with the loss of physical sales. I'm wondering if the minister could please tell the House what the government's response has been to helping small businesses adapt to the digital marketplace in Niagara West and across the province. The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member for Niagara West uh, for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's no sugarcoating it, and as we said yesterday, these are difficult times unlike anything we have ever seen before in this province. And our government understands that small businesses have been forced to adapt very quickly, and that's why we responded through the $57 million commitment to Digital Main Street, the largest investment by any government uh, in the history of this country to help businesses go digital. Growing a business online, expanding into e-commerce has become a huge priority for many business owners. Through our investment, small businesses can now receive grants of up to $2,500 to help launch their business online. The program is going to help up to almost 23,000 businesses uh, create and uh, enhance their online presence and generate Bonds. jobs for more than 1,400 students across the program. Thanks to this program, Main Street businesses will be able to expand their offering and seize opportunities online. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, my thanks to the Minister for this response. I know that this investment is incredibly important for many small business owners in my community and right across Ontario. When the pandemic began, many small businesses and businesses across the province were preparing to shut down, but supports like these have helped to bolster uh, many of these businesses. Minister, could the minister please, oh, sorry, Speaker, could the minister please update the House on the results of the Digital Main Street grant program over the last few months? Associate Minister. Thank you to the member uh, for that question. I'd be happy to update the House on the progress of the Digital Main Street program. Uh, over the first five months, we received 7,900 applications and businesses that signed up for the Digital Main Street Shop Here program and almost 2,500 just in the last month. And I'm proud to say that approximately 45% of these businesses are from outside the GTA, while 45% of the applications identify as female entrepreneurs. We have also established 79 digital service squads across Ontario to provide support for website setup, marketing strategies, and point-of-sale software to more than 13,500 businesses. 131 municipalities across Ontario now have access to a digital Main Street squad. Digital Main Street has been vital Response. to many businesses, and this has helped increase consumer confidence and make things easier for business owners. Well said. The next member, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Speaker, my question today is for the Premier. Yesterday, this legislature passed a motion condemning the extreme and hateful invective of Charles McVitie and to oppose any efforts to make Canada Christian College into an accredited university. The legislature has spoken. Even the Premier's own MPPs can't defend this decision. Will the government listen to the will of the legislature, stop defending the indefensible, and pull the bill rewarding Charles McVitie today, yes or no? Thank you. To respond, Minister of Colleges and Universities. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I <coughs> spoke about in this House on a number of occasions, and I will continue to stand and rise in this House and defend the process that our government has, a government process that is important, it's accountable, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's transparent, and it is what we are called upon as legislators to do. So I will continue to speak about the process, Mr. Speaker, and the process is this. There is an independent PCAP process. A party can apply directly to an independent body, that is PCAP. There's absolutely no way to stop that process from occurring, Mr. Speaker. No way to interfere with that process from happening. That independent body will review the particular application. They will report back to the ministry, and subject Order. to the results of that PCAB review, the legislation would then be proclaimed into force, Mr. Speaker. The opposition continues to play politics, Mr. Speaker, with this Response. issue. They continue to play politics, Mr. Speaker, for whatever reason they wish to play politics with, Mr. Speaker, but we will defend our democracy as we have continued to do. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, I reject the premise of that answer. <laughs> um, again, to the Premier, Speaker. With each passing day, it gets harder and harder for the government to defend the Premier's decision to reward his friend and close ally, an unapologetic homophobe and a bigot, Charles McVitie, with the right to grant university degrees at his Canada Christian College. Yesterday, sir, the, ma the vast majority of PC members decided not to. But even while the legislature says stop, the Premier has decided to rush this bill forward with almost no opportunity for public scrutiny. How can this government justify ploughing ahead with a reward to Charles McVitie, the racist, the Islamophobe, the homophobe, the transphobe, when even their own MPPs are too ashamed to defend it? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, so we have a process we've created, as I've referred to you in this House many, many, many times. There is equality in this, in this world, Mr. Speaker. There is equality within our Constitution. There is not only equality in our Constitution, there are fundamental freedoms that we must defend, and these are about procedural safeguards in our laws that must exist. I have spoken about this, Mr. Speaker, many, many times, and Mr. Speaker, I will continue to speak about it because Order. procedural safeguards are what make us a free and democratic society. They are guaranteed under our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and they must be upheld, Mr. Speaker. While I agree, uh, while I would not ask anybody to agree with any views of any party that they do not agree with, by no means at all do I accept that. No, by no means at all would we ever suggest that you should accept Opposition come to order. But what you must respect is that there must be process. And Response. that is what matters. Mr. Speaker, I will end, though, in, with, with some basic mathematics. There was not a single member on this side of the House that voted in favour of the opposition motion, because the opposition motion is not proper. Order. 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 The next question. The member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Um, Speaker, the leadership of Nishnabiaski Nation is working hard to keep the 49 communities in its territory informed of COVID progress and to keep them safe. They're providing access to COVID resources and information in Oja Cree, Ojibwe, and Cree, and posting case numbers and data on their website so that their member communities can be informed. The federal Minister of Health is in regular conversation with the Grand Chief of NAN as they work to ensure a coherent response on and off reserve. But the same is not happening with the Provincial Minister of Health. The fight against COVID has to be an all-government effort. There really is no room for jurisdictional wrangling, Mr. Speaker. NAN Grand Chief Alvin Fidler has been attempting to secure a three-way meeting with the federal and provincial ministers of health, and Federal Minister of Health Patty Haidu has agreed and is open to setting up a meeting. Will the Minister of Health for Ontario commit to a meeting with the Grand Chief and the federal minister to better coordinate the COVID response? Minister of Health. Yes. Of course I would be. Of course I would be, and I have been in regular contact with uh, First Nations leaders, Indigenous leaders throughout this, before the pandemic on a regular basis and through the pandemic on a regular basis. I've had a number of conversations already, and I would be more than happy to be involved in a, three, a meeting of the, uh, the three groups. Absolutely. Well, that's good news. Supplementary. I'm sorry. 
That's good news, Mr. Speaker. I spoke with both uh, Grand Chief um, uh, Fiddler and Federal Minister Haidu yesterday, and that's great news that you are now willing to have a meeting because they, they need that three-way meeting. The nature of a government-to-government -government relationship between the Ontario government and in Indigenous governments requires respect and open and ongoing communication. Advancing the process of re reconciliation as envisioned by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission requires an ongoing, concerted, practical effort in all areas of government, including child welfare, language, culture, education, justice, and indeed health. It's broader than one ministry, one issue, and it requires that federal, provincial, and Indigenous governments work together collaboratively. The response to COVID requires that co cooperation consistently. So will the Minister of Health, now you've already said, Minister, that the Minister has already said that she is having ongoing conversations with First Nations. Mr. Speaker, I just want to make sure Question. that the Minister will commit to a collaborative problem-solving effort with Indigenous and federal governments through throughout this pandemic because the needs are very different depending on whether you're in a dense Thunder Bay urban setting or on reserve. And the Minister of Health. I absolutely agree with everything that uh, the member has just said. That does need to be an open and collaborative relationship. I have been involved in teleconferences with a group of chiefs led by Regional Chief uh, Roseanne Archibald, and I uh, remain more than willing to engage in future consultations because I do recognize that there are differences, uh, whether people are living in urban areas or if they're living in fly-in communities. And I know that there have been many inequities over the years that we are seeking to address. So I would be more than happy to engage in whatever meetings um, would be requested of me in this respect. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. A little over a year ago, the government introduced the Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act. My question is to the Solicitor General. On January 1st of this year, the new provincially run model came into force. Speaker, the world has changed significantly since the rollout of this new animal welfare legislation, with our collective attention focusing on the many challenges that COVID-19 has been presenting. However, critical front lines, public safety services, including animal welfare investigation and enforcement, must continue to operate. It's nothing less than Ontarians expect and Ontarians deserve. So my question is, could the government provide an update as to whether Ontario's new provincial animal welfare system is working to ensure that animals are being kept safe? For Etobicoke Lakeshore and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very proud to answer this question on behalf of the government. Since establishing Ontario's provincial animal welfare system in January of this year, our dedicated team of animal welfare inspectors have been working tirelessly on the front lines while taking appropriate precautions to protect themselves from COVID-19. Our government set a goal for this year of having 100 animal welfare inspectors across all corners of the province, and I'm proud to share that we have made incredible progress on that front. And This includes dedicated inspectors with sector-specific knowledge in agriculture and equine. I'm also pleased to report, and I know my friend Lynn Perrier, who is a dedicated animal advocate out there, will be very pleased to hear that in the first half of the year, Ontario animal welfare inspectors have conducted over 14,000 investigations and laid over 100 charges. Speaker, that's a record, and I know we can all be proud of that. Response. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Through you, my thanks to the Parliamentary Assistant for the response on behalf of the government. It's reassuring to hear that Ontario's animal welfare system has been off to a strong start. I understand that the government recently announced a formation of an advisory table uh, to help inform the strengthened animal protection standards of care and other key regulations under the new PAWS Act. I know that Ontario is full of dedicated and knowledgeable advocates for our animals, including the Lincoln County Humane Society in my riding of Niagara West. As such, could the government please explain how exactly they intend to leverage the knowledge and skills as well as the expertise of these on-the-ground experts that they bring to the table? Great question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Niagara West for this great question. And I completely agree with the member that leveraging extensive knowledge of Ontario's animal experts is critical in advancing animal welfare across this province. This is a key area that I have been advocating for before my time as in the Ministry of the Solicitor General. This multidisciplinary table brings together organizations, including advocates, sheltering agencies, veterinarians, agriculture and industry partners, as well as law enforcement. These leading experts will help inform the work as we move forward in strengthening a wide variety of regulations, most notably the standards of care for our animals. And, Speaker, they've already started working. They held their first meeting last week. 
And I once, I once again want to remind all Ontarians, particularly as we start in the colder weather as it approaches us, if Response. you see an animal in distress, please call 1-833-9-ANIMAL. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question through you to the Minister of Health. Healthcare heroes working in hospitals in Niagara have been reaching out to my office in droves regarding an urgent situation. Under this government's supervision, as the second wave is upon us, the Minister, Ministry of Health has issued a directive to hospitals across Ontario to stop paying frontline hospital workers who self-report when they are exposed to COVID-19 and are forced to go into isolation. This government talks about the hard work done by nurses, doctors, personal support workers, and other frontline health care workers, correctly calling them heroes. Yet the actions of this government put them in an impossible situation, having to choose between reporting an exposure and feeding their family. Speaker, we are well into the second wave. Will this minister investigate, reverse this disgraceful directive, and ensure that frontline health care workers in Ontario's hospitals receive their full pay when they are mandated by the employer to self-isolate due to COVID-19? Thank you very much, Speaker. And I can uh, I can agree with the member opposite on one part of his question, but not on the second part. First, we do value the. Uh, incredible contributions being made by our frontline health care workers who go to work each and every day despite the rising numbers, despite some of the, uh, the fears that some people have. We have supplied them with the PPE. I heard that in the background. And they are there to serve. On some situations, though, they become ill and they have to, or they are exposed to someone with COVID and they have to go into quarantine for 14 days. What actually happened there was Ontario Health issued a recommendation to hospitals that employees in self-isolation from possible exposure to COVID-19 continue to be paid. Now, that recommendation was made by Ontario Health only to be implemented if a hospital believed it was necessary. I have certainly heard from Bonds. others, including the Ontario Nurses Association, that this is happening, that this is a concern of theirs because their employees aren't being paid for the time that they're being left away. So we are continuing. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, they, they were paid in the first wave. They're not being paid now. Th those are the facts. Uh, I've heard from employees who had to juggle their finances to cover mortgage payments because this government refuses to pay health care workers during a global pandemic. I've heard from other workers that previous sick pay they received uh, was deemed an overpayment and must be paid back. Local union reps tell me they're seeing a surge in retirements and staff shortages. Health care workers are risking their safety to care for the people of this province, and it's absolutely shameful that this government will not even compensate them when they're exposed to COVID-19. Cases are rising and the risk is increasing, yet with holidays around the corner, this government has decided to cut corners on the backs of frontline health care workers. I ask again, will the minister value health care workers in this province, treat them with the respect they deserve, and ensure that when they are exposed to COVID-19 in the community Question. or in the line of duty, they will continue to be paid? Minister Bell. We do value the work that's performed by our frontline health care workers, and as I indicated, this was raised to me quite recently through the Ontario Nurses Association. It is something that we take very seriously. We want people to be paid for the work that they do, and if they're not able to work because of an exposure to someone that they're caring for, then that's a, that's a situation that we need to look into, and we are working both with our hospital partners and with our nursing partners to find a solution to this to make sure that people are going to be receiving the pay that they should be receiving, uh, except for the fact that they've had this accidental exposure to somebody with COVID-19 and have to be away from work for a period of time. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. 100 per cent, it's not fair. That is what the Premier said when asked why big box stores like Walmart are staying open while small independent businesses are forced to close. The Premier had little to say about health care driving his decision, but he told us about business logistics. A study just last week from Stanford advised that a possible alternative was capacity limits for small businesses, not an all-or-nothing approach. Instead, the Premier is driving customers into Walmart, where everyone can congregate together in one place. Sounds like a good place to maximize the spread of an airborne virus, if you ask me. Why is the Premier not treating small businesses fairly and letting them open as he is the big box stores? Deputy Premier. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. This is a, a serious concern, and, and this was not a decision that was made lightly by any means uh, to put both uh, Toronto and Peel Region into, uh, into this lockdown. I know that there are going to be many people that are going to be badly hurt by this, but that's what COVID is doing. That is why we have to have these restrictions, hopefully for a short period of time, to start bending this curve so that they can come back, people can go back into business again and be open. But this decision had to be made. Small businesses, I know, are going to um, suffer considerably for this. That is why we are bringing in, we're doubling the amount of economic protection of bringing in for them from 300 million to 600 million. But they can still be able to receive online requests, telephone requests. They can still do business even though their stores are closed. But it's necessary in order to prevent the further Once. community transmission of this virus. It had to be done. Supplementary question. Speaker, remember when the Premier used to say he was against the elites and for the little guy? Two years later, the elites are running the show as the Premier makes policy based on special advisors and after holding phone calls with the CEO of Walmart, who talked him into letting them open full service while small business competitors couldn't even open under reduced capacity conditions. The other advantage Walmart has over Ontario small businesses is they can afford to hire lobbyists like they did in September. Walmart hiring the Premier's former executive director, David Tarrant, and a member of the Premier's advisory council of lobbyists, Melissa Lansman. Can the Premier tell us if registered lobbying from big box stores had any impact in his decision to allow them to run full service while closing down small businesses? Deputy Premier. No, it did not. And I would like to say to the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that is entirely unfair and entirely not the situation. The situation is this. Some of those Order. big box stores are staying open because they provide essential services. And that is the reason why many of them have pharmacies, many of them have food stores, grocery stores in them, whatever. We want people to be able to receive the essential services and keep the supply chain open. Those big box stores will be restricted. They will be operating at 50 per cent capacity. The number of people in, within those stores is going to be limited. There's going to be the distancing outside as necessary, but it's absolutely essential that they remain open because they have those essential services. It has nothing to do with anything else. Essential services is what we made those decisions. Order. Absolutely, that is, those are the facts, and that is how those decisions were made and will continue to be made in the future on the basis of the Response. best health data that we have available. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. During these, cha during these challenging times, it's never been more important to encourage new industries to contribute to Ontario's economic recovery. Recent analysis shows that by using more domestic hydrogen, we could import less natural gas from countries such as the United States, which would help keep energy dollars in our province and lead to spin-off benefits such as the creation of more jobs. I recently brought forward a motion uh, calling for, attention for more attention to hydrogen technologies here in the province of Ontario. It's been two years since the government released its Made in Ontario Environment Plan, and since then new opportunities and challenges have emerged, such as the wide reaching impacts of COVID-19, as well as new innovations and technologies. So I'm wondering if the Minister of Conservation, uh, Energy, Conservation and Parks could tell the House if the government is looking at clean technology and hydrogen sectors, and if so, how this will aid in Ontario's economic recovery and addressing climate change. The member for Barry Ennisville in Parliamentary System. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Niagara West for his advocacy on the hydrogen sector and the motion he introduced. Hydrogen is an area that we are actively exploring as a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality while creating opportunities and in industri in industrial growth. I spoke just about this very thing at the, at the QTRIC uh, conference yesterday, the first one ever, and through, of course, our Ontario Jobs and Recovery Committee, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks has met with many sectors, including the hydrogen sector, to support recovery efforts and develop a plan to stimulate our economy and growth. Our government sees tremendous potential for this new energy source. From fueling trucks and ships, low-carbon hydrogen can also be used for industrial purposes and energy storage, and it can be blended with natural gas pipeline to heat and power homes and businesses. We recently uh, released a discussion paper for consultation about the use of hydrogen and the hydrogen strategy across this province to both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and support the private sector when it comes to innovation and clean technologies across this province. And the supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. My thanks to the parliamentary assistant for that response. As we, uh, fully, as we strive to fully address the impacts of climate change, it is imperative that we look at reducing emissions also in the transportation sector, yeah, yeah. which generates about one-third of Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions. I find it a bit disconcerting, Speaker, that on the one hand, the NDP like to talk a lot about the importance of addressing climate change, and yet they fail to support any proposal that would put these words into action. As we've seen when they demonstrably voted against supporting public transit by opposing the Building Transit uh, Faster Act. We need a government that is committed to supporting innovation and technology while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So could the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks commit today that this government will work to drive innovative solutions, such as the exploration of options that use low-carbon hydrogen to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you to the member for that uh, question. Although hydrogen uh, is not a new idea, it has re-emerged as an exciting and potential long-term way to address climate change, air quality, while creating opportunities for industrial growth. Our, governments, uh, our government envisions a hydrogen economy that create, can create more local jobs and attract investment while helping us reduce greenhouse gas emissions using low-carbon hydrogen, especially in the transportation sector. The discussion paper we released is the first step to begin a province-wide conversation on what Ontario's hydrogen economy could look like and the considerations we need to make to develop a practical and actionable strategy. Speaker, Ontario is well positioned to drive economic growth in a low-carbon hydrogen economy. We look forward to building on existing strengths to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, attract investments, and create jobs in different sectors and regions Response. of this province. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 39 students and staff members at Begley Elementary School in Windsor have tested positive for COVID-19 with an additional two probable cases. The school is closed as a result. This is the largest school outbreak in Ontario. It's not a distinction that we want. The health and well-being of families and education workers is at risk. This devastating news has disrupted the education of hundreds of students and the livelihoods of their parents, who are now forced to stay home to facilitate their learning. Local teachers report that they are not aware of a single classroom at Bagley from grade 4 to 8 that is capped at 15 students. Physical distancing is impossible and cohorting is haphazard. This Conservative government's refusal to listen to experts is causing serious harm in our schools and our community. Will the Premier admit his plan is a failure and finally put measures in place to protect families? Minister of Education. Speaker, to protect our schools, to protect our seniors, to protect our most vulnerable, the Minister of Health and the Premier just days ago announced that the province is taking action, moving Toronto and Peel into lockdown level restrictions, limiting social gatherings, taking action in other regions, moving them to higher levels of restriction. Why? Why did we do that? We did that to protect what matters most to this province, which is our kids, which are our seniors, and the most vulnerable, and we will not apologize for acting in the public interest to limit community transmission, to do everything we possibly can, recognizing, as I think we all honestly appreciate, the risk within our schools is a reflection of the risk within our community. It is why we are acting province-wide in the context of our plan, fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, fully funded, $1.3 billion, the highest in Canada. It is not a coincidence we have 2,700 more teachers. It's not a coincidence we have almost 1,200 new net new custodians. Spons? We put a plan in place. We've listened to the science, and we will continue to respond to the risk. Well, Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to point out to the minister I was talking about Windsor, not Toronto or Peel. There is also an important equity issue here that the government continues to disregard. Windsor's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Ahmed, has rightly noted that this outbreak and school closure places a huge burden on families, many of whom are low income and can't afford to miss work, or are newcomers and may not be able to facilitate learning at home. With the Health Unit reporting that there have been 10 schools in Windsor-Essex with confirmed cases, I am extremely worried about the implications of further outbreaks for families in our community. Will the Premier finally do what parents, education workers and experts have been pleading for? Will he cap class sizes and implement the screening, testing and tracing needed so that parents can work and children can have a safe learning environment in Windsor and across Ontario? Mr. Education. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, I think what should be noted is while we see increasing rates of community transmission, there's been an incredible 
resolve and demonstration of collaboration between public health units in Windsor, Essex, and the local school boards, whom I've personally spoken to both in facilitating dialogue with them to ensure we do everything humanly possible to reduce outbreaks and reduce COVID transmission. And speaker, what I can assure the member office is when you look at the actions being taken in the public health unit, they have immediately communicated with parents. They've sent testing into the school to provide that support for the kids. And as per my uh, responsibilities as Minister of Education, those students immediately pivoted to online learning to ensure they continue to learn in a safe environment. We are taking action province-wide to reduce the risk, given that risk is rising in the community, but within our schools. A data point that I think should provide some element of confidence is that today 99.894% of students are COVID-free. We realize the risk is rising. We will continue to be there for our schools Order. to keep them safe. Order. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, in the first wave of COVID-19, healthcare workers showed up to protect all of us. And Speaker, they're still doing that each and every day, putting their personal risks as they face the front line. And this was acknowledged with a $4 pandemic pay, a temporary measure. Pandemic pay is long gone, but healthcare workers are still working diligently on the front line. Many are exhausted. With the rates of COVID-19 transmission reaching new heights in our province every week, especially in hotspots, healthcare workers haven't gone through a first or a second wave. They've been working nonstop on the front lines since the pandemic began in this province. Instead, the province has insulted nurses and other provincially regulated health care workers by capping pay increases at 1 per cent, by removing their ability to collectively bargain their contracts. And, Speaker, through Question. you to the Premier, will you show your acknowledgement of the high risks and the value of these exhausted workers that are doing this work in the face of COVID-19 by reintroducing $4 pandemic pay through the end of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Their response? Member for Willowdale, Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we certainly appreciate the hard work of our frontline officials throughout this pandemic, and that's why we introduced measures to enhance pay. Uh, and the member mentions pandemic pay, but we also need to continue to support those frontline workers who are hard out there working throughout the second wave. And that's why we are providing reasonable wage increases while respecting the taxpayer dollars and investing in frontline services for the people of Ontario, well, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that any future legislation doesn't imp impede the collective bargaining process to make sure that uh, the fair wages continue for this uh, sector, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we responded with a $45 billion financial package that provided significant support to countless Ontario families and businesses, Mr. Speaker. These supports will continue until COVID-19 is in our rearview mirror. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the member opposite knows very well that this budget did not provide any significant and meaningful increases to our health care system. So after the missteps that Ontarians have experienced with this year's flu vaccine rollout, many will be relieved seeing the planning out that, the gov that is out of the government's hands and is now being overseen by a competent and decorated general. However, rolling out a vaccine doesn't just pose logistical challenges. There are social and economic challenges as well. This is particularly true in communities where there is hesitancy to take transit or to take time off work. They, they have no ability to take time off work with pay for fear of losing a paycheck or a job that they can ill afford to lose. Speaker, through you Question. to the Premier, does the government have a plan to make sure that vulnerable residents are not prevented from, the, from taking this vaccine because of the hurdles that they face due to COVID-19? And will you fund public health? Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister of Health to reply. Much. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. This is an important issue because we, um, uh, we've been dealing with COVID for months and months now. This is the light at the end of the tunnel, the fact that we do have vaccines coming forward but from both Pfizer, Moderna, and now AstraZeneca has one that's also uh, about to come onto the market. And so we need to make sure that we deal with this, dealing with all of the issues that are important here. And that is why we have General Hillier. We're very proud to have him to uh, lead our COVID vaccine task force. By 
but uh, Minister Jones and I are going to be the responsible ministers, and we are going to be working with all of the local ministers of health, working with all of the communities to understand what the barriers are to people being able to receive the vaccine. And we are going to work out all of those issues so that when the vaccine hits Ontario, we can get into people's arms as quickly as possible and make all of those barriers um, uh, invisible so that people will be able to have access, whether it's Fonts. transportation, whether it's hesitation, whatever the issues are, we will work through them. Thank sure. you. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. This morning is for the Premier. There are over 100 outbreaks in long-term care homes across the province right now. In my riding of Ancaster, an outbreak at Chartwell Willow Grove is continuing to grow. The cases have climbed to 79, and 15 people have tragically died. We share in the tremendous grief that families are feeling right now in Hamilton. We have enormous respect for everyone who has been working around the clock for months, but they can only do so much. They need help now. Experts warned for months that without urgent action, the second wave of COVID-19 would be disastrous. But this government continues to dither with task forces and studies that you don't listen to, while the deaths in long-term care are climbing. Speaker, this is a crisis. Homes have been asking for months for a clear plan from this government. So where is the plan? When will we see the urgent action that this crisis in long-term care demands? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. There is no question that there is a sense of urgency, and there has been a sense of urgency right from the beginning. This is an integrated response by multi-ministries, multiple experts, our scientific and our medical experts. And in specific to Willow, uh, Willow Grove, there are currently 15 resident cases there, uh, and it, it is improving. I want to correct my record from earlier when I referenced 92 per cent. 92 per cent of our homes have no resident cases, uh, and I, I just hope to correct that record. Uh, what we know is that we have an invisible invader called COVID-19 that is ravaging the world. Ontario is not unique, and we are taking every measure whether it's looking at the IPAC, the capacity in our homes, the staffing, uh, the stabilization uh, of our staffing, the wardrooms, all of these measures are ongoing to address. And we have not stopped. We've put dollars behind these, over a billion dollars for our long-term care homes, and we'll continue to provide the resources that are- Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind the minister that those 15 people aren't cases. Those were 15 deaths, deaths of our loved ones, not cases. And it's been eight months, and homes have been asking for months for a plan, but still nothing from this government. The two hospitals in Hamilton managed to plan and act on the transformation of a hotel in Hamilton into a satellite facility to treat patients during the second wave of COVID-19, and yet still nothing from this government. There's no new money in your recent budget for long-term care, no plan, and certainly no new money to hire additional staff in long-term care. It didn't have to be this way. Instead of trying to save money, you could have been saving lives. The Premier's iron ring never happened. We all know that. Staff are exhausted, families are frightened, and our seniors are left vulnerable. My question, why is this government question. unable or apparently unwilling to urgently do all that it takes to save the lives of our loved ones, seniors, residents in long-term care? Ask the members to please take their seats. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, our hearts go out to everyone who's been impacted. Uh, as, as a physician for almost 30 years, dealing with life and death and grief, I fully understand. And our government is putting every measure in place, including the $243 million put out to shore up staffing initially, the $405 million to shore up infection prevention and control and staffing supports, the $61.4 million in capital repairs, the $461 million to support our PSWs with improved Order. wages, the $30 million to train and hire IPAC specialists, the $14 million for PSW training funds, the $10.3 million for return of service, the, the $26.3 future support for PSWs, and the monumental for Hamilton, four West, Stony hours Creek, of direct care on average per day per resident. Our government Spons. is the first government 
to take long-term care Mountain seriously and fix a broken system. Order. The next question. The member for Ottawa, Vanier. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Even before the pandemic, more than two-thirds of Ontario's post-secondary students had experienced overwhelming anxiety. Over half of students had difficulty functioning due to depression, and 16 per cent of students had seriously considered suicide. This pandemic has added to the stress and worry of our students, isolating them from their social circles and putting them in difficult financial situations. Speaker, the mental health of our post-secondary students is in a crisis, and students often have difficulty accessing mental health services, having to wait on average three to four weeks to see a counsellor. Speaker, our post-secondary students need our help. What is the government doing now to provide post-secondary students with the mental health services that they desperately need? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, really happy to uh, be able to respond to that question. Our government obviously recognizes the importance of mental health, and we've indicated numerous times that uh, mental health is health. Uh, we recognize the importance of so many areas within this, and um, I'm so very terribly concerned when we hear about some of the concerns we see on our campuses. Uh, some of the issues that have arisen over the course of COVID have been uh, really difficult uh, for so many students, uh, and I really want to take an opportunity to say some uh, real positive uh, reinforcement and uh, tip my hat to all of our professors and our faculty across the sector who have done an incredible job. Uh, when we first ended up in COVID, um, so many of them had to work to personalize course content to try to make that easier for students. They had to find ways to connect with students to support mental health. And so I, I want to speak in the supplemental more uh, specifically to some of the uh, initiatives of our government, but I really want to take this opportunity to speak about our faculty and our professors who did an amazing job, Mr. Speaker, Response. at the outset um, in order to connect individuals uh, and connect with their students to try to uh, really support them in their mental health throughout the uh, initial stages of COVID. Supplementary question. S Speaker, college and university students have also seen their post-graduation job opportunity diminish or even vanish as a result of this pandemic. The government helped to address this issue earlier this year, implementing a six-month moratorium on student loan repayments to give students more time to find a job post-graduation in this tough economic environment. However, while the pandemic continues to limit to limit job opportunities for new graduates, that moratorium on student loan repayments expired back in September. Last week, I met with students' leaders from Ontario's post-secondary institution, and they are asking that the government give graduates more time to find well-paying employment before requiring them to repay their student loans, as well as with more mental health services. Can the minister explain why the moratorium on student loan repayments has not been extended Question. to support our graduates as they transition to the workforce? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, just to continue on to some of the previous uh, comments I was making, um, with respect to mental health in our institutions, uh, our government, as you're well aware, have not made a historic investment into mental health uh, of $3.8 billion over the next point years. Uh, sorry, $3.8 billion over the next 10 years. And uh, with respect to some of those specific funding amounts as they relate to colleges and universities, uh, we made some direct supports of $19.25 million this past year, which was an increase of $3.25 million over last year. A program I'm really excited about, Mr. Speaker, is the Good to Talk uh, texting support program, which is a $5.6 million investment that we provided this year. And Good to Talk, Mr. Speaker, is one of the most exceptional programs I've been able to see, especially as we've been relating with COVID, for so many individuals, for so many students out there, Mr. Speaker, it's so difficult to make that first connection, uh, especially when students weren't on campuses, and for a lot to be able to text for the first time and then get the supports thereafter and be connected with uh, a mental health Response. service provider was so exceptional for students. I think what we really have to stress, Mr. Speaker, is we want students to talk more. We want everybody to talk more about their mental health so we can learn more, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for York Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As case counts skyrocketed in communities across the province, the need for quick and accurate testing is more important than ever. Unfortunately for the people of Ontario, the minister has chosen not to deploy 
their rapid tests, instead choosing to sit on them for months. Communities like mine in York Southwestern are desperate for resources like these, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister tell me how many rapid tests the province has it in its possession now and why they have, they have not been deployed? Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. You're absolutely right. The rapid tests are, as the uh, Premier said, a game changer because they're needed in so many different communities and in places like the long-term care homes in some of the more remote communities in Ontario and in many other locations. But I can advise that we have received 98,000 of the Abbott ID Now tests. We have 1.2 million of the Pan Bio tests, and they have been deployed to a number of hospitals and uh, long-term care homes and other areas of congregate living. They are being deployed now and will be used uh, within the next few days. And I will be having more to say about that at 1 p.m. this afternoon. The supplementary question. Question back again, Mr. Speaker. It is not acceptable to sit of these tests while people get sick, while communities like mine face devastation. Families, workers, and all Ontarians deserve better. So I ask again, Mr. Speaker, why has the government spent one long month sitting on these rapid tests, not using them to identify cases and keep people safe? Thank you very much, Speaker. And I would say to the member opposite through you, Mr. Speaker, is that we have not been sitting on the cases. We have been actively moving them and deploying them to the places where they are needed the most. We know that we are, are dealing with situations where people want to visit relatives in long-term care homes, that the staff need to be tested. The Minister of Long-Term Care has indicated that in areas of the high-risk zones, people are going to be tested weekly. These rapid tests are going to be greatly helpful for that, as well as for the people that are going to be visiting the homes. We also also need them in our hospitals. That's where they're de being deployed right now. And as soon as we receive more supplies through the federal government, we will be sending them to more hospitals and more long-term care homes. The, the need is urgent. We recognize that, and we are moving these tests very quickly. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. The